cloud and here goes for a while. Okay. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, take it away. All right, cool. Uh, let me move this bar up. Okay, so armed and dangerous. Um, so what's this about? Uh, this is a talk about, you know, just generally like what's the state of ARM uh, with Linux. Um, but ARM, even though everyone's using it on their Macs right now uh, that are using Macs because it was kind of forced on them and there's lots of uh, uh, hype about it. We're going to talk about some history. We're going to talk about the, what the current state is a bit, where things are going, and we're going to have a discussion about some stuff I've learned as over about the last decade working on Arch Linux ARM as a uh, avid user, friend of a maintainer, and turned into a dev. Fun uh, fun fact: before I got using ARM and Arch Linux, or sorry, Arch Linux ARM, I was a Debian user, and that. Uh, so if you have any uh, complaints about my uh, love of Arch Linux or ARM, you can blame Jason Plum. And if anyone needs contact information on Twitter, whatever, I will provide that as needed to give him hell. Just say, we'll, uh, we'll send his regards. So, all right, let's go here. So, uh, who am I? Um, not really just another uh, average person. IRC handles Dago Red. Not working anywhere right now, so I'll, I'm still looking around, but I'm also enjoying some time off right now. Uh, I went to Iowa State for electrical engineering and aerospace engineering controls, and I've been doing software development and getting into DevOps uh, pretty much because uh, I've also developed a love for GitLab and some of those wonderful tools. Um, and relevant experience for this talk is, uh, like I said, about a decade working on ARM, on, on Alarm, which is Arch Linux ARM. So, and apparently I need to go mute something. Anyway, um, so what to expect. Uh, so we're gonna do a brief history. We're gonna do ARM explanations of how it works uh, and talking about like what's the difference between RISC and CISC. Uh, pain points of ARM, stuff that we saw originally as a distro with Arch Linux ARM and some of the early adoption. Um, we can also segue into that with how Raspbian and uh, talk about the single board computers uh, for how painful that entire experience has been, how Raspbian for a while wasn't even doing, and I don't even know what the current state is, but for a while was doing things poorly uh, from a distro perspective and what to expect as there's some new stuff coming along, uh, coming up the pipe that we need to start looking at and considering. Uh, and then SBC, SBC for definition, it stands for single board computers. That's your Raspberry Pis, it's your Odroids, that's pretty much anything you can find on Adafruit or SparkFun that has an ARM thing saying it can run Linux or Android. <clears throat> Uh, we'll then talk about some Apple-based silicon, which is the latest and greatest and some of the more uh, uh, easier, accessible, and finally getting the single board computers that we've been looking for in the ARM world uh, for consumer use. And then the future, um, it's not x86, and we're and hopefully we'll come to a similar conclusion, uh, but there's also a little surprise there for you. So uh, first, our Acorn started off after they heard about it was kind of just like, you know, fun, nice way of talking about like, you know, a friendly computer stuff and kind of going like, okay, well, Apple sounds really friendly. It's a fruit thing. Well, they're not going to go with fruit because that's, you know, already used. They're going to use Acorn. It sounds like Apple. And this is made from a bunch of people who are in uh, Cambridge, England. So they were trying to make their own computer scene in England to compete with, well, just to kind of you know, be, uh, go with the hype. Uh, the founders are Herman Hauser and Chris Curry. And then the one thing that you need to know is that the, uh, the Acorn Risk Machine process was started by, uh, her name is now Sophie Williams. It was Robert, Willi uh, Will sorry, was sorry uh, Sophie Wilson. It was Robert or Robbie Wilson. Uh, so please note that if you see the same name, it wasn't, you know, just know it's the same person, uh, just so you have your history correct. Um, Acorn, when they started out, was the same with a lot of other people uh, when they were starting out in the industry that wasn't Intel or IBM, were poor. So they were trying to work on these chips. And during the time, uh, a lot of these, uh, the chip industry was really focused on like really small calculators. Um, there's a huge uh, discussion about how the change of the industry is there with the VLS, with the history of VLSI. Um, if you want a really good view of that, read the book, which is a business book on, uh, on, on OKRs, standing for Objective Key Results. Um, just Google it uh, for if you want to see what John Dorsey is about. But the first few chapters were about how Intel pushed 
the 8806, the 8088, and uh, how they really kind of got dominant of the market. And if you want to know why Intel is the way they are and why we all use Intel, this business book tells more than it does about the technology. Remember that. So most technology, uh, it was a group of uh, came around and they came up with this. Uh, they were one of the early adopters for a paper that was uh, released in Berkeley on risk computing. Moss is really known because they were the inventors of the 6502, which was this little microcontroller that was significantly cheaper than the Motorola 6800 and cheaper than all the competitors. And it was one of the first risk processors out there. And even though it was cheaper, they had less uh, uh, instruction sets, they could run at eight gigahertz, or sorry, eight megahertz. And eight megahertz was key for having specific feedback and had the performance that enabled things like Atari with video games. It enabled uh, the Apple, uh, was the Apple II to be such a gangbuster of a, of a uh, computer, mostly because the response time with it was so nice. Um, and then, uh, was it? But while Moss was building this up and they uh, uh, forked off, they had this headquarters in, in Arizona. And I believe someone from, and from the history I read up, one of them, and I couldn't find the source for it, unfortunately. Um, resources at the end of it. Uh, and I will put out the link in just a moment. Um, Someone found a invite to Moss Technology, and they flew out there and they saw that this group of in Arizona were making these processors, and they weren't Intel. It was in a garage. It was simple, and one of the things. So the uh, the reason why that was important is because at that time, if you wanted to make chips, you had a fab, so your design could go to the fab and be self uh, be self made. Well, now fabs are starting to open up to so you could have fabless companies making IP and then make the chips. Well, the problem is that some of the chips, in order to have the money for it, you would go through the mass cost. But the real expensive part was the ceramics for the chips themselves. They were made in for heat dissipation. So uh, at that time, uh, Arm did not have the money. And they're like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And this is still like in like 1983 is where they uh, started looking at looking at the processor. But the the uh, the one thing that Acorn Computing is really known for is the BBC Micro. Uh, it was a response to the UK Parliament was like, "Hey, we need to go invest in something." Now, key thing: we have a company in England focusing on uh, on computers that they want built in the in the nation, and they also have this uh, support for getting into education. Um, a lot of the people that were working on the BBC Micro were also tied to the Sinclair computing, which made the ZX uh, Spectrum. If you know the from your computing history, the Z80 processor, that is the one that scared Intel. And today, from that time period, the Z processor has messed, or we're still confining to code written on the Z processor, which is on all of our network stack. I think all, uh, now I'm dyslexic, so I'm going to screw this up. I believe the where are the computers that we use now, both ARM and x86 are little NDN, and I believe the Z80 and PowerPC is for the most time were big NDN. And our IP stack, if you look at each frame as it comes through, it's actually firing off the least. Uh, sorry, the first bit it sends is the uh, least significant bit, whereas everything else is the most significant bit. So if you ever go diving in, and if you're a ham radio person with AX25 standard, just know that everything is flipped because of the Z80 at that time. Um, but anyway, but those are the big processors, and they're mostly focusing on SIST processors at that time. And then Acorn, because of all the stuff they learned about how being uh, how poor they were and trying to figure out how to optimize and looking at what's going on with MOS technology, they dove into that, that same research paper that MOS technology did on risk processors, and they started making a very small instruction set which was originally designed by uh, who is now Sophie Wilson. So ARM2. So, oh, and then finally, the um, effectively dies in 1990. In other words, the, the computing industry part of it didn't happen. So ARM LTD was, was created mostly in 1985, built on the prototype for the original processor. ARM Risk Machine is the company that, or ARM LTD is the company that we know of today. It was a separate venture from there and spun off became its own company. So going back to the whole thing of ceramic chips were expensive. Well, do you know what's not expensive? Plastic. Problem. Plastic chips 
can only handle about one watt of power. So a prototype was built in 1985. And what was funny is that in the prototype, when they went to hook it up, they I think they screwed up a lead or something like that. But the processor itself was actually, um, was the processor itself was running on like 100 millivolts. And they were surprised because they're like, oh, this is running weird. We don't know how or why. But in the end, um, what's uh, what they discovered is it was running on leakage current from the probe at about 100 milliwatts which for a low power design was unheard of at that time. And we, and, and just to put things in perspective, blowing 20 to 60 Watts on like a four megahertz system at that time was considered to be power efficient. Okay. So this is fantastic. Like I think the, uh, the 8806 runs on 20 Watts um, normally. Uh, so that was the first prototype and that, and I'm sorry, our, sorry. First prototype was built in like 1983, 84. The um, the first ARM one, which never really got too much adopted, was 1985. So ARM two was released in 1987. Key thing on these ARM two, think about that in in terms of uh, today's na uh, naming scheme. Think ARM V two as the processor spec for it. So 1986 gets a little interesting. Apple begins doing some internal R and D work on ARM, looking for uh, was it for with the Newton. So immediately after uh, was it immediately after ARM was created, Apple was already like, ooh, we have ideas, and they were looking at risk. <laughs> um, officially, full sever, uh, sorry, the, the Acorn, or sorry, the Acorn Risk Machines uh, like department or whatever was officially 100% spun off in 1991 to be called the Advanced Risk Machines LTD. Uh, the original investors were Apple and VLSI, and definitely if you get a chance, look at a VLSI the history of that company, which later became LSI Corp, uh, is very interesting. And what's hilarious is that at the time of inception, that company was trying to be like, oh, we don't want to make just calculator chips. We're thinking about the future. They literally said, we're making a business that we that is meant to be sold and not to be sustainable. Um, personally, I worked at LSI Corp and uh, right after the Agir merger, and uh, which merged to become Avago. I was out of there before it was Avago. And then Avago bought out Broadcom and then turned themselves into Broadcom. Remember the BBC education? Broadcom, oh, we'll, get, we'll get in the Broadcom chip in a little bit. Um, so yeah, anyway, and there's a little presenter comment. Um, so ARM LTD, early adopters of Fabulous. Uh, in fact, they were like the first uh, chip, no, second. First one was the, uh, was the MOS, or it was the, yeah, the MOS chips. Um, ARM licenses go to uh, the Digital Equipment uh, Corporation. Um, you'll know them. Uh, there's there's a key person I, I'll mention later on that was involved in this company and some other work with ARM and StrongArm. But uh, ARM started finding the way in e uh, Ethernet, the PDP-11, if you've ever heard about that piece, VAX machines, and the 64-bit alpha chip. And then StrongArm, the cool part about the StrongArm is that in 1995, it was almost impossible to get any chip above like 100 megahertz. Yet, strong arm was running at 233 megahertz on one watt. At this time, I remember I was uh, in Minnesota. My dad was working for IBM, and he went to this conference at the time for risk uh, was it for risk processors and talking about the how it is the future in Louisiana. IBM was using that to kind of say this is the way we're going to be building all of our power PC stuff at the time. And who was, uh, uh, sorry, the one company that was surprised to not even have a presence there uh, was uh, Intel. Intel did not want to have anything to do overall in uh, the, the uh, risk business initially, but then later on, they tried to buy their way back in. Um, so yeah, so Strongarm, uh, so that name I was talking about before, this part of that DEC company is named Dauberful, uh, Pohl, uh, if you look him up. He anything early. He was an early adopter of using uh, ARM and the strong ARM uh, design. Was a part of following it even when it went to Intel for a bit. Intel started using the strong ARM. Uh, oh, and I misspelled strong ARM. Great. Um, to basically supplement their i sixty line. Now, uh, fun thing though is during this process, Intel had what was it? End up selling it all to Marvell uh, at the time, but they still hold the ARM v six license to this day, which is kind of weird because this is one of their big competitors and kind of came out of nowhere. Also, Intel hasn't invested in ARM v7 or 8 or 9 and doesn't have a architectural license with them, like let's say Apple does. <clears throat> uh, in 2002, 
Uh, just a little, some benchmarks. In 2002, arms partnerships was 1 billion arms ships out in the world. Uh, at 50 billion after 2014, obviously 50, uh, the Apple, or sorry, the, uh, the uh, was it this ARM7 chip is the one that Apple used on their first iPhone? Or it could have been. Let me go double check. Okay, no, sorry, 2007, using the ARM11 chip. I'm sorry. And that was ARM, ARM V6. So that 214 number is at, you know, all the uh, device, or sorry, it's all the um, cell phones. But also there's a something I'm, I'm ignoring in the talk completely, which is embedded systems. Like we're talking about like Atmel, microchip. There's an ARM component that runs at about 200 megahertz that you can use that doesn't have any external RAM, doesn't usually tend to run a, uh, a, a uh, an operating system. That's also part of that uh, large number too, uh, or that large number as well. <clears throat> uh, was it 2008? A uh, big thing that changed Apple is that they bought a PA Semi and PA standing for Palo Alto. And that Dan Dabra uh, poll is once again involved. Uh, they're known, for, that's where all the Apple Silicon has been coming from during that time, the Apple specific silicon where the architectural license comes from. So, and that's really kind of what's enabled the future that we have now where Apple is so integrated right now and kind of beating out a lot of its competition um, with ARM development, unless you're in like some crazy server area, which we'll cover a little bit. Uh, 2013, uh, Apple releases the ARM V8 processors, which is 64 bit, which kind of caught everyone off uh, by surprise. And then uh, in 2014, 2016, the CPU design started using the power of VR GPUs, which are the graphics, uh, the graphics components inside the system on a chip, ARM processors, and is essentially putting in graphics cards on die that are competing with the graphics processors and some of the codecs on our graphics cards in desktops. So the inclusion and uh, and uh, growth of the uh, use of built-in graphics explodes basically around this time, including with single board computers. How to get to it becomes a problem later on. So generally speaking, when we go to talk about some of the architectures, um, ARM v4 is kind of where the start of everything is like as far as what we were exposed to with uh, industrial controllers, that kind of stuff. But in terms of what we were doing in the Linux world for like a distribution to support it, specifically with Arch Linux ARM, we didn't really touch too much with V4, but you could. Note, any of the code that we see, or any of the ARM versions that we have listed here could run the original ARM V1 spec. Specifically to ARM V4 is where you're going to make sure that you can run all the way back. So, and if you have a compiled code from that ARM V4, it'll work on all of them uh, going forward. So true backwards compatibility. Um, it's something that a lot of other CPUs, like the Intels are trying to do, However, they get really fancy with how they're trying to implement it. But the fact that ARM can do all the support for all the additional instructions and still fit within their original address or their assignment bus of a 32-bit uh, uh, register is still pretty amazing. Um, so ARM v5, ARM v5 uh, didn't have any floating point unit. And that's something that you really need to look at when you're compiling code and understanding how it'll work. Uh, it was also limited originally at the cores to like one to one, you know, one or two cores. Um, and uh, the one Mar, uh, and this is also Marvel buying up uh, some of the uh, stuff for like their built-in NAS stuff. It is optimized for great throughput. Yeah, ARMv6. This is what your Raspberry Pi is built off of, and there was a lot of focus on it. But uh, the thing about ARMv6 that was annoying is that you in the or in the Linux distro space. It had optional floating points. So just because you built for ARM v6, you would have to compile two of them, soft float and a root float. And it made a huge difference with computational and trying to use a computer, like doing Python, science stuff, edge node, that kind of uh, any type of math operations was painful without having hard float. But for compatibility, trying to have trying to compile the soft float was normally a standard practice that was just a pain. Limited to four cores uh, max. Now, uh, ARMv7, this is the one that most of our cell phones that we've always really paid attention to and known on our lives when we became a uh, mass Android adoption. Um, it's, it uh, supported the, uh, it was a floating point in V3 and V4, and it was forced. Everything was hard float on it, which made supporting it from a, distribu a distribution perspective a lot easier. ARMv7 also experienced, was during the terms of the, the Linux kernel time, 
was uh, Linux kernels like 3.8, 3.12 was in response because the, around the Linux kernel, like 3.02 kernel, Linus was getting pissed because every chip was forcing its own kernel device driver package. Yeah, so if it was like a Cortex A7, like that same silicon, if someone else were to package it differently, like a different pinout, but it's really the same chip underneath, it was a different, it looked in the Linux kernel like it's something completely different. So the response from the ARM community, which was basically either, they said either fix it or forget. Well, the Linux, uh, the ARM community decided to respond with fixing it. And that's where we have um, the device trees. And the device trees basically is a programmatic way that you compile the muxers for all the ARM processors. But you do it afterwards and it's pin specific and it never has to touch the Linux kernel. But it's really cool is because you compile it separately and it has to be part of the Linux kernel. You literally use the cat command. So it goes Linux kernel, the device tree, you cat out and, and the binary, the, the, the combined binary has everything. Uh, let me see if there's a question. Oh, the 64 bit change occurs with ARM v8. In ARM v8, I don't have the timeline here. I think that was more like 20. 16, 2017 is when the ARM V8 changed, when it was available on 64-bit computers. Or, or sorry, when the 64-bit uh, single board computers were released. <clears throat> uh, so, and then let's see here. Uh, Neon. Neon is the equivalent to SSE2 on the processor. Think about this for your matrix math and your math coprocessor to kind of like really step it up for scientific computing. And then uh, they uh, also what's built in the spec, but it was never used was virtualization book. Uh, virtualization. So they actually would allow hardware virtualization of let's say x86 if you wanted to and a compatibility layer one, uh, handled at the hardware level. So if you ever hear the Rosetta stuff, whatever uh, on ARM V8, that's where it comes from. And then also coherent SMP. Oh my gosh, was that so cool. So uh, Samsung came up with this awesome chip called the Equinix uh, series. And it was huge for no uh, for doing the big little architecture, where you would have um, four big cores and four smaller cores that were more energy efficient. And within three clock cycles, it could go from going energy efficient to the big ones, and then back to the small ones again. And then there was this uh, what was it they called it a homogeny uh, mode or something, where you could actually run all four cores at once in a single board computer if you didn't care about the power consumption. And that was amazing. And that turned to my build box for a while because those Samsungs were nice. Uh, problem is, is that at this time for the RMV sevens, uh, with one ex with the exception of one, you could only get at max two gigs of RAM on those single board computers. And it was an absolute pain. Arm V8, um, everything with Arm V7, but now Neon is forced, it's in there. You don't have an option. Everything is uh, a, vo a virtual floating point ver uh, V4. And this is where you also get the hardware crypto acceleration. Um, we have better virtualization support. And this is where the 64 bit comes into play with Arm V8. Go down. All right. So Arm V9, I had to look this up for the talk, and I thought this was the coolest thing ever. Um, cause I, I, none of this stuff has really kind of hit the market that I've been paying attention to. Um, so this is stolen directly from one of the slides I was talking about arm. Uh, I'll, you know, I'm going to do us a favor right now and I'm going to get the link to share to this on the chat. So everyone else can go skip through if they want to copy link. If I can find the chat again. All right, there we go. So yeah, you got way you guys can skip through as needed. More history. Let's go to enter. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, anyway, so they're going to be working on enhanced vector processing. So that's the neon stuff that you're thinking of, focusing on machine learning, did, uh, digital signal processing. So a lot of your DSP, think about your augmented reality stuff. Security is going to be really interesting. And then they were spending the full ARM V8 compatibility because that's how literally how ARM works. Everything is backwards compatible down to the original. The original binaries will always work on newer ARM processors, but not the other way around. Um, performance, expected to be a 30% increase specifically for the mobile stuff. Um, Neon is going to be replaced by SVE2. So if there's any uh, um, optimizations or if you're looking at edge computing or if you're into data science, 
please look at those changes. I believe they're already out now with the Amazon Graviton instances or anything using the, the Ampere uh, hardware with the latest Chrome V9 stuff that already should be in a lot of cloud vendors like Oracle. Uh, enhanced floating, uh, so what's it bring there is enhanced floating point and mostly the big part that you need to see is SVE2 will actually handle matrix multiplications whereas Neon did not had to break that up. So that should be a significant throughput and uh, parallelization for matrix math. That has me personally very excited. Um, normally with ARMv8, we view this, uh, normally you see like ARMv4, 5, whatever, but then for ARMv8, there is a 32-bit version available, but no one really makes hardware for 32-bit because why the world wants to be 64-bit. So ARC64 is how we mark it. Please note that with ARM V9, there may be a new designation with that. So you may need to know if it's going to be like AR64 V2 or something. We don't know, but it will have the additional enhanced uh, instructions for the SVE2. And I don't think there'll be a lot of uh, backwards compatibility with the Neon stuff as a drop and replacement. So we will see. Um, the security stuff, the confidential computing architecture is something from ARM that you should really be checking out. Uh, one of the two highlights from it is we understand containerization and virtualization right now on a software level. Well, there is one thing that ARM is going to be doing to go another layer around it. As uh, let's say Don was mentioning earlier about the whole issues with the uh, side channel attacks related to kind of like Spectre, but whatever the name of it is now that I forgot. Um, they're doing these things called realms. So the realms are in, in the compute namespace of the cache. You come up with a realm. A realm is very much like a container, but it's a manifestation of it in hardware. And then you have a realm manager to make sure that if you run in those realms, it literally cannot see any of the cache from any other processes, threads, or whatever outside that realm that hasn't been marked. Another thing that's kind of really got me excited, and uh, Kingdon, this is something I think it's going to be worthwhile for you to check out. And I think we need to think about talking about WASM and security with this feature is memory persistence. They are now allowing memory tagging extensions, which were originally released in ARM v8.6 or an ARM v8 spec 8.6. And there's a link to it if we want. To, uh, I didn't put the link to it. Oh, it's probably in here um, that you can go through it and check that out. And part of the reason I put the link there so everyone else can see you know, where some of the stuff is coming into. So there's matrix math. Anyway, yeah, uh, RMV86A is where that came in, or it was RMV8.5, uh, I can't remember, but anyway. Um, that's got me really, uh, uh, was it interested because a lot of the uh, device or the side channel attacks are going to be gone. And I cannot remember what, I can't remember what slide I was on. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, cool. Yeah, features and release. You mean like a checksum to prevent row hammer? Say that again? You mean like a checksum of RAM that would prevent like row hammer type attacks? Uh, no. Uh, we're talking about cache and, well, uh, caching specifically. So when you do the memory tagging, well, it'll also be in, in RAM. Um, it means that if when the tr processor is checking to see what RAM is available and what is not, um, what happens is that if you do not have access to that tag, you can't read it, including like anything left over, anything that's kind of like, so if you're setting memory and freeing it up, it's not a free for all in the cache for multiple threads and processes and namespaces. You actually have to go through the, uh, it was a, it's an additional part of kind of like the realm manager so that you can only, whenever you go to reuse Met RAM, you're going to only use RAM that you've touched before. And then there's a specific cleanup on it too, to make sure that any type of like branch prediction stuff that's usually getting hammered or from like some null zero attack, that won't be laying around on the RAM to read the state later on. So that's what the tagging is doing. So basically you can only see what you are tagged to do. And finally, uh, so the processors, the three new processors for ARM v7 that they have for the architecture that you're going to be seeing, the ARM Neoverse v1, this is uh, going to be the first one that should have already been out. That was released in earlier, or sorry, about like mid-2000 or 2021. Uh, later 2021 was the Neoverse N2. This is your uh, edge computing one. 
So it's not as uh, it's not designed to be as powerful for throughput as the Neover as the V1 is, but it will be significantly more power uh, sorry resource uh, um, conscious. So if for proper edge node computing, it is the way to go. Lots of cameras. It's also just supposed to be able to support some like applications of digital signal processing and a little bit of light AI at the edge. This is what you're going to see like connected to any type of like 5G edge node or whatever. And then finally is the Cortex series. The Cortex series is what's going to be your mobile compute, like your cell phones, that kind of stuff, uh, tablets, whatever. And they'll score up to three gigahertz. Someone asking a question? Or he's got uh, no, it looks like uh, Don has a hot mic. Uh, I'm uh, taking him out. No, right it's all now. good. Sorry, not, Don. Not, not Don, sorry, uh, Dan. Uh, Dan Arthur, he always does that. Hi, uh, Dan. <laughs> it says hello. He, yeah, he just uh, dropped it off. So, anyway, ne never mind. It's all good. It's all good. All right. So, accelerating CPU performance. Okay. So, this is basically the specs to kind of look at for latency. So, we're going to see latency going up to 90 megahertz for ARM v uh, ARM v9. I'm sorry. Performance will be between 2.6 gigahertz. Or sorry. Uh, frequency will be 2.6 to 3.3 gigahertz, um, which is going to be impressive. Bandwidth. Look at that bandwidth. Sixty gigabits per second going through. This is some of the, uh, this uh, metric is important if you're going to get into big data for processing and ingestion. This is normally the bottleneck for it. And then uh, yeah, caching is just going up to what two meg or something like that or whatever. And yeah. Um, so another thing they're talking about that normally doesn't get uh, mentioned and something and one of the crutches of using Linux and ARM. Because we don't have external graphics cards, the only way to start probing around and figuring out what's going on gaming is just, or not gaming, with, uh, with the graphics drivers, is just to blindly go around and try to see what's happening. You cannot go in unless you have a giant fab to decap the part, pop a, pop a or something on the trace, and you have to go through the glass layers and everything like that in order to start debugging and figure out what's going on uh, with the driver. Since you don't have that capability in the open source Linux world, we have not been dealing with this very well. And the graphics drivers have been getting away and the graphics companies have been getting away with it because it works great on Android where all the money is, but to use a single board computer, it hasn't been going so well. So uh, if you ever want to know a reason why there's a re uh, why ARM is not the vision for everything, uh, in the future, it's because it doesn't support, it's not really free. The instruction set is free. Everything else is supporting is free. But if you want to start using it as a regular daily driver, the graphics part has left a lot to be desired and nobody will open source the graphics, which is hilarious because ARM owns a lot of the graphics or the Molly chips, which are used in a lot of the different uh, processors. And I think they sell it as IP that you can have different ones that you want to, to put right in on your system on a chip so it's like figuring out a graphics card, but it's all done at once and they just package it and just boom, one chip. And that's all you have to worry about. Um, but the nice thing about the new one coming up is that uh, they are going to be focused on game consoles specifically. So we're going to see ray tracing, variable rate shaders, advanced rendering uh, uh, inclusion, like, you know, DirectX 9, whatever, directly in with it. And uh, there's going to be some additional virtualization support. They're doing specifically for backporting of game consoles and for, you know, in for in server environments. They want to further enable people to get off of their x86 reliance. I may not be a fan of some of the things ARM is doing, but this is the Lord's work as far as I'm concerned. Delivering and then, oh yeah, uh, so yeah, and then they just want to have an easier to use GPU. I'm hoping this turns into more open source drivers that actually don't suck, but I'm not holding my breath and neither should you. So here's some, just a couple of things of like some boards that were popular back then. I literally ripped this off of, uh, of a presentation that Jason Plum gave. So ARM v5, pretty much there's no floating point, virtual floating point support. It's all soft float, no matter what. So, but the throughput is with Marvell, the throughput is absolutely fantastic. Um, this free scale you'll see mentioned a lot for by people because uh, People who are advocates of free and open source hardware, if they don't have the money to go for uh, for a uh, um, was it for uh, in a power PC motherboard, which costs like five grand to make and it's kind of like poorly supported with modern specs, 
they'll usually tend to look at these uh, some of the free scale processors and this is the first one they tend to look at you know initially um arm v6 is one of the weirder ones because of the, the weird state of floating point virtual floating point versus not is it there or not um the one chip that you should be paying attention to is this one this is the original uh, raspberry pi chip and one of the fun things about this particular chip is while well, everyone has done a bunch of work with the chip and the graphics drivers on it, you still have to pay an additional $5 license to Broadcom directly. And they give you this code based on the serial number to unlock that chip in order to get access to the better enco or, uh, encoders and decoders. So you can actually get full, uh, uh, did, was it full HD out of it at speed without killing the chip. If you don't do that, everything else is rendered in soft, uh, software, and it is a terrible chip for that. Um, this is the, you're going to start seeing the single board computers with ARM v6s and ARM v7s because these single board computers were dev kits originally made, and then some other people decided to go mass manufacturing for the hobbyist environment, but really they were test kits uh, from, and based on reference designs from, let's say, Texas Instruments, Freescale, all oh, the Samsung Equinos, mm, great chip that was, uh, used on uh, Samsung tablets, uh, the Chromebooks um, specifically. Anyway, but, the, but these uh, chips were made, uh, originally sold in the single board computers to be dev kits for people evaluating the chips for cell phones. So once the, uh, once the, uh, once the NDAs and whatever for the chips, and once they went the latest and greatest thing out there, and there's a ton of like chip supply out there, these reference designs would get repackaged and then done a relay out based on the reference design. And then these single board computers would come out, which means we ran into some other fun problems. Um, we don't have any ARM V8 boards because my buddy didn't have it. I didn't have enough time to go through ARM V8 boards that are on the market. And honestly, if you have access to a, a, any of the M Silicon uh, uh, Mac minis, you're better off. Um, so, all right. Part of uh, what's going on, uh, the difference between why arm or power pc that apple's looking at versus let's say the intel stuff sys versus risk if there's anything that if you have to walk away if someone has to ask you for a definition the biggest thing is that your access to the memory and how the data structure path goes with it risk tends to work directly uh with each piece instead of going through a law uh, a line of uh um of uh of uh, other circuitry so in risk architecture, if you want to, uh, with your instruction cast or anything that needs to, the most you'll ever have is like two clock cycles that you need to go through in order to access something. Whereas uh, with the 8806, when I used to do some uh, like op code with it and I had to make my own little compiler for like a class once, um, that wasn't Iowa State for that one. That was a, That's a long story. Um, I discovered that it would take like five clock cycles, five to seven clock cycles to go through a CISC to go connect to anything in the chip and then return a value. And then also CISC has this annoying time of every time you go to do something, it drops the value that comes out of it, like a return statement, whatever, in the accumulator, which is a separate register. Whereas in risk, you may not do that. And it may take, do some error, uh, some math processing and then dump its result in one of the input registers after that is cleared for that clock cycle. The reason why this is important is because if you don't have an accumulator, you don't need to have any sort or a, a separate accumulator register. If you don't have that, you don't need to have a separate instruction for working with the accumulator every time. Additionally, you don't need to move anything from one register to another because all your registers have ways of pushing and popping values from one register to another and how it's looking at the program counter and the program stack and that kind of stuff. So if you can reduce all of that, you can now have three instructions do more work than five instructions of CISC. And you don't have to, or, I'm sorry, you only have three instructions to work with that you have to worry, use. You don't have to worry about the accumulator um, with the other side. Um, but the bigger issue is with CISC, each one of those instructions may take more time to run, more clock cycles to run, so you're getting killed. So one of the metrics that you need to see when you're seeing this kind of stuff is the metrics that you're looking at are flops per watt is the metric to look for. 
if you look at flops per megahertz, you're going to see an obvious solution of just crank up the, regu- the, mega- uh, the, the f- clock frequency and you're going to do better. Not exactly the case, especially at, what, at the frequencies that we're running at now. Now the frequency efficiency matters, and that's where risk will always dominate CISC. And Intel has spent a ton of money trying to compete with uh, the fact that risk can do more per cycle. And because there's less circuitry, it's easier to crank up the amount of uh, the frequency that it can run at. But they're all getting stuck at about 3.3 gigahertz to get, come out of a system unless uh, they really want to do something crazy uh, as is. So because of that, the advantage of CISC will never uh, be their full term. So if anyone's like, oh, no, I don't like ARM for whatever reason, they come up with an excuse for like compatibility. Those are also a lot of lies and, and uh, things that Intel has used to keep people on the Intel hardware and just to promote their CISC. And even then under the hood, your CISC processor isn't even a CISC anymore. Even Intel gave up on it. They start looking at the instruction set. Now your Northbridge on a Intel processor runs Minix. And that Minix is turning that opcode from x86, translating it into risk, uh, a risk code underneath and optimizing it before sending it to the processor. So because of that interaction, uh, x86 assembly by definition is now considered to be a high level language, whereas risk, they don't even have anything in the processor step. The instructions you have with the opcode, go to the processor and do the thing. That's it. There is some branch predict- prediction stuff, but it's running at speed versus being running through an external interpreter on a separate chip outside of the processor. So Cisco has made a real na- really nasty mess for themselves, and I don't see them catching up given the efficiencies and also seeing how compilers are getting around the dirty tricks that Cisco used in order to continue its dominance, as well as the fact that uh, Cisc was like another programming language also for like hardware engineers back then and compiler engineers. There's some dirty tricks that took years to get out of the GCC compiler that they're finally out now. So we shouldn't have to worry about it. Um, so big. Uh, so uh, reason why CISC was, uh, uh, also got dominance is because with fewer instructions to do something, because you had more instru- or fewer instructions in terms of like, you know, do A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, you need to do more of those steps and programs would be longer to execute something than Cisc would, because Cisc would have more instructions, but they could do more things. And the reason why that was important was because storage was stupidly expensive. And if it wasn't for Cisc, some of the benefits of computing wouldn't have been realized if it wasn't for that pitch originally like the 1980s and even in the 1990s. The compilers had some dirty tricks in order to enable that. And some of those uh, programming tricks still, or sorry, like I said, are all gone just recently. And because of how things work with like, uh, in, with the uh, different uh, compilers and opcodes and how different chips work, it was like talking to someone uh, with a different programmer, but uh, a different programming language, but literally like uh, the Cisco programmers were the JavaScript or like the, the basic developers of like the 1980s and 1990s, just because it was so much simpler to get something done. Um, Linux also didn't really exist until, as we all know, until 1991, and no one really cared until like about 1995-ish anyway, even though it was still pretty early. It was mostly Unix. Um, and yeah, and uh, also just note that uh, getting above 16 megahertz was an accomplishment for 1990. 100 megahertz was, I think, about as most as you could get, or like 133 uh, was like the most you could get for like an Intel Pentium at the time. Um, so 233 megahertz in 1995 was blindingly fast. So uh, going back to the system versus risk argument, I've already mentioned that for the proprietary code, runs Minix, uh, complicated Cisco. Oh, yes. Um, the additional circuitry for how, what each instruction could possibly do and have available to you has two things. One, it consumes more power. Two, as you have multiple generations of processors and you add to that instruction set, if you have a complex instruction set to begin with and you add more features, you have more address space. That address space means that even taking in the opcodes needs to grow and becomes more complicated to read in at the program level. Whereas ARM is still on the same 32-bit word size for all the instructions that it was originally designed for back in the 80s. 
And like I said, the main metric you're going to be looking for here is flops per watt. Uh, so, oh, uh, another fun thing. So we are at a weird state right now where um, Intel is stuck at 10 nanometers for manufacturing, whereas TSMC focuses only on manufacturing as, and supporting fabulous customers. I think they're even talking about maybe releasing three nanometer stuff for memory stuff. I need to go double check that, but the one year old documentation I was looking at and what I've seen, AMD is able to use seven nanometers and I think they're looking at five nanometers and TSMC does definitely offer to all customers right now that are willing to pay enough five nanometers, assuming you aren't in China. ARM is usually uh, packaged in what they call a system on a chip. In fact, I've never seen a discrete ARM processor for, R, uh, for ARM v5 and up. I think there was an ARM v4 that I've seen, but I think largely the socket stuff is kind of way. They're focusing mostly on IP setup um, for and, and making sure that all the IP is figured out and how it's set up and laid out and uh, architectural licenses and uh, are all handled right before they even do tape out for the chip itself. And uh, now because storage is cheaper for the program size, in fact, compared to what programs are doing now, our programs may be slightly larger on ARM, but the data sets that we're looking at is so much bigger and we have the capability for storing it now. The argument for x86 originally is pretty much lost and it's losing its competitive advantages at the higher end as we run into the end of Moore's law. Adoption. Uh, this is not easy. Um, ARM is a complete pain uh, for getting started at, at first, um, just because most people don't know what they're doing. Uh, if anyone remembers when people first got their uh, Apple systems, they're like, hey, I can't run this VM to do my development work. Surprise, it's not x86 underneath and they weren't supporting the full rosette and virtualization at the time, nor should you still re uh, re rely on that. Um, building the tool chains for it was also kind of fun for a while. Um, ARM adoption was drastically, in my personal opinion, slowed down because of Steve Jobs um, with his uh, cancer. Uh, he was the one, he aggressively pushed for Intel to for that switch at the time. And he also approached Intel about making the first chips for the iPhone. And Intel was like, oh, that's not going to be a big market. We don't want to go do that. That's going to, you know, we're not going to make any money. And then Intel basically gave away everything that they were going to do or had the chance to do that. That Steve Jobs wanted to work with a single source on it um, for uh, for the iPhone. And as you can imagine, the iPhone's a hot seller. It's 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 a a huge it's a piece of history now in terms of how it came about um intel literally lost that one because they were you know full themselves um containers uh early uh arm was slow to have docker containers um the a little pitch for the pennsylvania people uh jason plum was the person that worked with docker to figure out how to get it to compile an arm uh, we have the merge request to prove it. I know Harbor Light likes to talk about it, but we can go show how our work with Arch Linux ARM supported it. The big thing is, is that people were identifying ints and floats and that kind of stuff, but they weren't identifying what kind of float, if it was like uint8, u832, um, and they weren't identifying like default word sizes and how to uh, handle that with the compilation of their code. So that was the change that we started working on with, as Arch Linux ARM. And that helped Docker compile, and we made our first original packages for it and got a, a, a Docker container adoption on ARM because of the 32 limitations of ARM v7, ARM v6, that kind of stuff at the time. ARM v8 was uh, just sold around that time for the IP, but we haven't seen any single board computers for it yet. Um, Multi arch manifests were still like barely being considered at the time. So when you say get, you know, like Ubuntu latest, it would just assume it was, X80, it was x86 and it wouldn't figure out, oh, it was this, you know, for, you know, ARM at the time. That didn't happen. So that was something that later on got added on. And then most software developers still don't have a single clue on how to make a container. Single board computers are still not a first class citizen. In other words, um, if you ever see a board and you'd say from like a spark phone, whatever, just know that the Linux kernel that you get it with and the U-boot that it comes with it, which you do need to make sure that your U-boot and your kernels match up 
U-Boot is a universal bootloader, look uh, DOS U-Boot. Um, that is a tool that essentially loads the Linux kernel to boot Linux. And it's there because there's no BIOSes and there's no EFI for a lot of the boards. So you have to boot into the memory, the, uh, the processor and the spec tells you, or in the processor guides uh, in the um, manual or not manual, the user, uh, the device manual or something from the uh, documentation says it's going to look at this IP address. It starts loading in your program for DOS U-Boot. DOS U-Boot does some stuff, gets some stuff set up the driver and then kicks off and then starts off the boot with the kernel. Then the kernel will load something like system D and then the rest of the computer that you know of today will boot Linux. Um, we were talking about the device tree stuff that came up between 3.8 and 3.12 for the Linux kernel. Um, that is still black magic, and I would love to know how they do uh, late or put separate compiling polymorphic binaries, which is amazing. Um, oh, and for all those single board computers, and the reason why they're locked is because they're not pushing their changes upstream. And a lot of the times, a lot of the manufacturers will find out some sample code stolen from Android that won't pass the quality checks and what you need to do to submit to the Linux kernel. So your device drivers, particularly graphics, will never, ever make in the Linux kernel. So the device kernel that you get will never change, and it's a pain. And finally, um, the Raspberry Pi, I already mentioned it, some of the graphics stuff, whatever, it's not completely false. There's just been a lot of adoption, a lot of work with it. Great, you know, for the foundation, but it's still not free and open source software completely yet, like, because the ARM chip underneath and uh, some of the uh, um, NDAs you need to sign to look at some of the stuff. So U-Boot um, and kernel, as I was saying, mainline. Mainline being it is pushed up to the main branch of the kernel and will be maintained by the kernel maintainers over time as things change. If you don't, uh, if you are making su supporting a separate branch, you are compiling and releasing this kernel on the side of all the changes that are happening within the main kernel it is easier to get your code into mainline and just leave it there because it will generally not break even though it's barely tested, that kind of stuff. But as things change underneath, they have great automation and things to check underneath for the kernels. So there is a mainline uh, generic kernel for ARM for different versions that you can use. Just know that one of the first things that you tend to lose is your graphics support. Uh, but you can still get basic networking, and get the serial interface is always going to happen there. Some of the USB stuff gets a little weird, uh, but some of the extra stuff in, this, uh, in the system on a chip uh, may kind of be kind of flaky for support. Um, most sysadmins and maintainers of distros don't even understand how a lot of their packages work. They have a system in place, but because they don't know how to automate it, uh, it means that it, getting it off of just their x86 systems that they have in their builds doesn't allow for other systems to work. Arch Linux ARM, their big, uh, the main reason why they can do so much or so little is that they wrote a tool called Plug Build, which listens to upstream Arch Linux. And whenever there's a new package release there, they grab it, they go to build, it goes into a database. If it fails to be remediated and checked out, and there's some ways to, uh, to do like some manual diff and patch. So you can look at the upstream package, build it, and then just put your changes on right before you go to build yours. And uh, yeah, and that's essentially how plug build works. And that's how uh, the automation works. And that's kind of my exposure to DevOps that I would love to see more people get exposure to instead of just thinking Jenkins does everything for you because that build tool will handle 4,000 packages, updating, maintaining it daily that uh, Jenkins still needs to click and sometimes find some external hooks and doesn't work nearly as fast. Um, QEMU is used for a lot of, auto, uh, of emulation for some of the builds. Dirty little trick, some builds don't build on native ARM hardware because QEMU on an Intel system essentially has a stack pointer that is damn near infinite, whereas you run into those limitations quick with ARM. So one of the first things, if you're ever building for ARM, try to figure out, like for instance, uh, there's some stuff and I can point to an example if we want to with compiling Dino, Dino.land. It's a uh, JavaScript runtime environment written in Rust. It will not compile on ARM unless you set it to like 30, 16 or 32 threads, because otherwise it throws everything, builds everything in one thread, and then tries to link everything in that one thread, and it's just a pain, and then it just dies in the weirdest way, and the errors are horrible. Um, but that's one thing you just watch for if you're ever having to build natively on ARM hardware, as you should, because building a native ARM hardware will do dependency checking natively 
to the system and not try to emulate how or what it's trying to look at. And um, the linker, it, sometimes you get some linker errors if you try to emulate that. So the best thing you can do is do linking and dependency checking on native hardware, but you can do use dist CC, which is a distributed compiler on x86 or whatever is faster available hardware, but you do need to put the tool chain in there. And then you can take the compiled like the dot out files and they can be thrown back in and linked by the native hardware again. And yeah, and if you, uh, and oh, and then still too many people are relying on virtual machines thinking that'll solve all their problems for them. Compatibility layers, just know that um, you're putting, leaving a lot of performance on the table. Uh, yes, Apple's done a great job of it, but I would not be relying on that for the future. Um, so yeah, and now if we wanna do, Oh, so there's some uh, articles in here if you want to, like supercomputers and ARM. At one point, the fastest supercomputer in 2018 or 2019 was made by Fujitsu and was using um, ARM processors for it. I know uh, in China, the Tizen supercomputer was using ARM. Um, so if there's ever been a question of everyone's like, oh, ARM's slow, ARM only works on cell phones. It also works on supercomputers too and has been for a while. Um, the adoption of ARM by AWS's Graviton has been fantastic. Uh, Oracle's also been diving into it as well, based on Ampere. And then there's, uh, and I'll go to an Ampere link. Um, because of how the license works with ARM and how portable it is, I see a lot of AI, crypto, and other specific integrations being done with ARM that you cannot do because of how the license is written for x86. Um, so uh, right now, and going back to one of the comments that uh, I wanted to say about uh, um, about Asahi, is that uh, Arch Linux ARM has had an issue, and the core issue, even though that almost all of the Arch Linux project is in GitLab, the problem is GitHub. That build tool I talked about, plug build, has to make a lot of requests because the source for the packages that it needs to compile point to GitHub and GitHub has been doing API limiting. So if you're building and rebuilding and managing dependencies that's listening to the changes at the frequency of Arch Linux, you can imagine that the minute that GitHub put some API limitations in for requests by, uh, was it by, you know, for like automation, you can imagine a build tool, especially where you have multiple builders doing the checking out and the distributed compiling, would run into a problem pretty quick. And that is part of the issue of why Arch Linux ARM is not the healthiest right now. And because of that issue, uh, Asahi, I believe, has been looking at a better experience. Now they're trying, they officially made kinder words about saying uh, full support for you know a different uh, uh, environment. Uh, just know that, uh, I, it's not going to be going too far because in the end, as long as your U-boot matches up or your boot information uh, matches up that you need to with the kernel and the kernels are still building, everything else in Arch Linux ARM will work. Just break because uh, Arch Linux ARM has been focused on what they say, bring your own kernel. Once you have everything set up there because of all the specific bits and the non-free parts that we have to fight with ARM all the time, all the other packages just work. So that is part of the reason why they're never going to get rid of it. And it was really great for them to do development work because we had a bunch of tools to get them set up um, as far as just general ecosphere. And I'm running Arch Linux ARM, uh, Asahi Linux with ARM now. We'll do a quick demo on that and also show you how to start, but I won't complete the, the installation of how it looks like on, on Mac Mini. And you can dual boot easily. In fact, they prefer you to dual boot only. Um, so yeah. And uh, as far as ARM, I mean, the commitment from the industry They've already said that Amazon, uh, and this was released like uh, just last week or two weeks ago. Um, Amazon, almost half of all the servers that they're using for Amazon, and that's Amazon as not AWS, is running on Graviton, which is amazing. So industries are chasing after it now. And if you aren't familiar with it, now is the time. Uh, but yeah, and then for Asahi, for a quick little demo, of what it looks like to get started. No, so there's the thing about the Asahi for, and oh, this is not Fedora that's going to, it's called Fedora Remix. Fedora Remix has been trying to become a main thing on the Raspberry Pi for years. They have a very large team dedicated to it, unlike Arch Linux ARM, and they have had less to show for it for a while. But 
just because they've had a list to show for it for a while doesn't mean that they haven't been trying their heart out. So yes, they have something fantastic. I'm very excited to see what Asahi is going to do with it. I am sad that uh, they're not going to be fully supporting Archlink's arm. I will be addressing that when I can because my M1 Mac Mini that I've set up for Arch, sorry, for Linux only will be there. That'll be a future presentation. And hopefully I'll have a little bit more advanced notice on when I'm doing that instead of Andrew just saying, hey, you know, what about that talk that's not working out right now and making this instead? Um, and let's do go through some quick other things before we go play around the demo quick. Supercomputers, general. Uh, okay, so let's do this quick. Uh, power consumption, why you should be running this at home. Uh, just looking at just the Mac hardware. Now you can extrapolate to whatever you want to. Uh, most of my single board computers, their max power consumption is about six watts and they're usually idling below, below one watt. Uh, because of the power supply and some of the additional other pieces that they have in the M1 Mac Mini, and they don't have a lot of the other optimizations turned on because seven watts is still pretty freaking good. Um, thermal output 23 BTUs per hour. I mean, versus in 133 versus like look at their Core i7. There's just a substantial difference there, and I'm sure if anyone else has used enough, you know, laptops, you can, you know, how you feel like it's baking in your lap. Uh, I don't hear too many people complaining about the uh, Apple Silicon laptops in their labs right now. Uh, another piece is too is the benchmarks. Um, we could have been seeing this for years, but the reason why we haven't seen the adoption uh, and the, these kind of numbers on ARM hardware specifically in these environments is because I solely credit to the fact that Steve Jobs started getting sick and having issues that really impacted the direction of the company to get away from Intel. And they were just kind of floating by for a while without really kind of reinvesting in the business. So I think everything that we're seeing now, we could have been seeing almost as good about five years ago uh, for that adoption. And uh, conclusion, um, get used to the tooling and definitely adopt some of the stuff with ARM because it's the future. I, there's no doubt in my mind and I've been bullish on this forever. But I will have to say that I am going to be watching and probably adopting Risk Five because ARM is not free enough. We've already seen what free open source hardware and software can do. And for me, um, I would say look at Risk Five and the place your bets. Five chip member uh, makers are already betting big. Um, chip ma uh, betting an entire foundry and your entire IP uh, uh, library on what you're going to be doing is going to be huge. Now, the big name here is Qualcomm. They're the only ones actually making any decent sized processors of any complexity that people are going to really care about. The rest of them are focusing more on smaller embedded systems. So that's your microchips, your Atmels, which are now the same company, your, you know, uh, Renosis, that kind of stuff. But uh, you got to get your foothold in the market someplace. And I think Risk Five is going to be a complete monster uh coming up for and, and there's already a big company chasing effort called sci Five that would be watching and that is the entire presentation i believe and here's the resources page if you have any questions well, thank you yeah uh, any demo requests Like, does that someone want to see Kubernetes running on ARM on an Apple hardware? Does someone want to see what it looks like to start off the installation for Linux on an Apple system? I'd like to see the install. Yeah, the install sounds I'm not going to do that myself because I'm All right. Cool. All right. So the demo gods are going to tempt my system. And if I accidentally go off, um, yeah, uh, Ken, uh, the hardware for RISC processors in general have a deeper history than most people understand, um, but that's okay. So, uh, all right, so install it is. Um, let me go figure out where those instructions are. So, you know what? I know I put the link someplace, but we're going to literally do this live. So, installing. And as for the, the uh, comment of uh, compiling where you, you want to run it, uh, come on, that's what Java and uh, .NET is for. You you build it once, you run it everywhere, right? Um, I, will, our... I will proudly stand up and say, I think there's still hot pieces of garbage. I think .NET has gotten fantastic, but uh, Kingdom Barrett may still be on, and I'm going to have to say WASM, I think, is more of the future than that is. 
So yeah, you're still no, uh, sorry. That, that was uh, sarcasm. I will stop the uh, the demo here or the the recording. So, in case you have passwords or stuff like that, we're not. Uh, I don't have to go clean them up. No, no, no. I I really appreciate that. Yeah. So we're gonna go uh, for so let's here. Install. Uh, 